that's associated with this spring force, this ideal spring force. Actually, MGH is not appropriate here because weight's a lazy bump. What is the energy associated with springs? It's the one that kind of looks like that, at least in form. Or in our particular case, in this particular problem here, since I defined our position just using an x, I'm just going to write x squared. Okay. Initial is equal to 1 half mv final squared plus 1 half ax final squared. All right. So we've set up our energy equation. Energy initial equals energy final. Now let's see what we can get rid of. We're trying to figure out where the speed is the maximum. So I pull this thing out, I let go. This is my initial right here. What can we get rid of? Final potential. Final what? Final uh, potential energy. If you already know that the kinetic, uh, the potential energy is zero at equilibrium, that's where we're getting the maximum speed, then yes, zero. Because Final equals zero. And I will tell you, when you're dealing with MGH and we have to decide where do you want H to be zero, you could do the same thing here, but let me just tell you, make H is equal to zero at equilibrium, or sorry, X equal to zero at equilibrium, you save yourself a bunch of hassle. So that was the assumption. Yeah, I did write down that assumption. What else can we get rid of? Initial kinetic energy? Yeah. Why? Because it's not moving initially. Yeah, that's where I let go. So we basically uh, reduce our equation down to two things, which happens a great deal, but not always. So when I have kx initial squared, plus one, uh, sorry, equals one half mv final squared. Mathematically, we can get rid of the halves, but you know, some people might keep them in there, but I know k was given to you, that was 20. What's my initial position? Seven meters. Yep, it's my amplitude is equal to my mass, which is three, times Vf squared. Uh, I don't know where three came from, which is four. So we get 20 times seven over four is equal to Vf squared. Uh, that's 35. And so Vf is the square root of 35. Uh, something went off. Oh, that's seven squared. Seven squared. And so if you work that out, I think it's going to be somewhere around 15.65 or so. Um, it's just hurt my gut feeling.
So we had a second way of actually finding the maximum speed. Now, Madison, did you get 15.65 because you worked through the math over there, or you just knew what the answer was? Uh, I worked through the math. You worked through the math. All right. So. Not coincidentally, it happened because of it. All right, so let's take a look at that and just show that why we get the exact same thing that we got over there. Because this seven here is just the amplitude. The 20 is the spring constant and the four is the mass. So if I suck in the letters, we have, uh, let's see, 20 was the spring constant times my amplitude squared is equal to my mass times VF squared. This is basically, Plugging in K, this is my amplitude, and that's my mass. Divide by mass, I get A squared, K A squared over M is equal to VF squared. Take the square root of both sides, I get VF is equal to the square root of that, which is the square root of K over M times my amplitude. Well, the square root of k over m is my angular frequency, which is what we did right here. And it all stems back to, well, one, the definitions we've done, but stems back to the law being made. Maximum acceleration, no, questions on this before we talk about maximum acceleration. Sounds like a huge groundswell for, no, we don't want to hear about, we want to hear about maximum acceleration. What is the chapter four formula that involved acceleration? Or what's Newton's second law? There should not be this long of a pause. What's Newton's second law? Third, third. This one's the equation. That equals MA? That's the one. So my acceleration is just my force divided by my mass. And the force is, well, when we're dealing with a spring, is directly proportional to how far this thing has been pulled. So negative k times delta x, or I guess the way I'm doing it for this problem, x over m. So it's negative 20 times x, which is 7, divided by m, which is 4. Which is negative 35 meters per second squared which is what we had before. And again, for the same reason, let's go through the, the steps here. My acceleration here, my acceleration is maximum when the force is at a maximum, which is when it's stretched the most. So my acceleration would be negative K times my amplitude over my mass which is negative square root of k over m. Oops, try that again. Uh, yeah, I am gonna write it that way. Negative square root of k over m squared times a, which is negative omega squared a. Now what I asked before was what's the maximum acceleration without the vector symbol right here. Down here I do have the vector symbol. This negative right here just indicates that when it's when my displacement is positive seven, my acceleration is a negative thing. It's going to be pulled. When I pull the most this way, it's going to be accelerated that way. If I compress it seven meters, so my displacement was negative seven, uh, position was negative seven meters, or displacement was negative seven meters, then my acceleration would be in the positive direction. I know what you're thinking. That's great, but 
There was that topic about the vertical springs that you skipped over. We should really discuss that. I'm thinking, yeah, we should. But first, are there any questions? All right. Groundswell again, it is. meters there. Then I'm going to attach a mass to it. Let's make it, since I keep going, going to throw a three in there for the mass, let's make it three kilograms. And it is now stretched. Uh, six meters. So this is just the spring hanging in. This is an equilibrium position right here. So basically for the three kilogram mass, I let it hang and then just gently release it so that it's not oscillating back and forth. So it's not like I attach the mass here, let go, and the thing's just bobbing up and down. So I just put the spring here. <clears throat> and so now I'm gonna take that same situation and now I'm going to stretch it. So my three kilogram mass stretch it 11 meters from the very top and I let go. So the first bit right there where I have the four meters and then six meters, all that is just so you can find the spring constant. So let's actually do that. Let's take a look at the forces acting on it here. Uh, what are the two forces acting on the mass as it's sitting here? Weight. Spring tension. Yeah, spring force. Yeah, spring force. I, spring tension worked for me. All right, it's an equilibrium, so what do I know about these two forces? All right, so I have Fs, the magnitude of Fs is equal to W, and so I know that Kx, or delta x, probably more appropriate now, is equal to mg. So K is equal to mg over delta x. And the reason why x does not necessarily seem appropriate here is that, um, I haven't really established where zero is, but I, ha I do have all my distances based upon here. So this is basically my zero. And what I care about is how far that the spring was stretched with the mass on it, not how far it is from up here. And so plug and chug at this point, that's three times 9.8 divided by how far that mass made it stretch, which is Emphasize that it's not six, it's two. So this becomes 29.4 divided by two, which is 14.7, I think. Yep. Units? Newtons per meter? Yes. It almost sounded like you were going to keep going, but stop. All right, so 14.7 newtons per meter. Uh, I'm going to rewrite that down here just so I have more room that way. Right. Now the question comes when I pull this thing down and it oscillates back and forth. I still have these two forces acting on it. I have the weight, this gravitational force that we're calling weight, and I have the spring force. Those are the only two forces acting on it. 
Which of these are conservative? Or which is conservative, either way, whatever's appropriate. Indeed, they are both conservative, which means I've got two potential energy formulas here. So let's take a look at that. Uh, actually, before we do that, uh, let's, let's take a look at it from the force point of view. So if we've got the forces, we have W acting down and FS acting up. So my equation of motion, uh, up positive or down positive? I assume that was your hand gesture. Okay. All right. So we have our spring force minus a weight is equal to zero. The negative in the formula for spring force, that F S equals negative KX or delta X, that negative is telling me direction, and I already know the direction. The direction is upwards. So we have K delta X minus mg equals zero. Uh, sorry, I don't know what I was thinking there. It's not equal to zero. It's not an equilibrium in this third situation down here. It's equal to mass times acceleration. Now recognize this delta x here is to this position right here. So I'm just going to call this x1, uh, call this x2, and call this x3. Because they are three different lengths. This delta x here is x2 minus x1. The delta x over here is x3 <coughs> minus x1. So this becomes k x3 minus x1 minus mg equals ma. If we play around with this a little bit, or basically going back to there, however you want to look at it, that's kx2 minus x1 equals mg. In other words, kx2 minus kx1 equals mg. Over here, we have kx3 minus kx1 minus mg equals ma. Just distributing the k. I'm going to solve for kx1 here and then plug into there. So kx1 is equal to kx2 minus mg. And I'll take that and plug it into here. And something actually really convenient happens. We have kx3 minus kx2 minus mg minus mg equals ma. Doesn't necessarily seem like it is really convenient, but let's distribute that minus sign there. So I have kx3 minus kx2 plus mg minus mg equals ma, the negative sign distributing. And now let's simplify. kx3 minus x2 is equal to ma. My mg's cancel out. And we could go through the energy bit also, and we come out with a similar result. I mean, it won't look like that. It'll be one half uh, kx3 minus x2 squared equals one half mg squared. <clears throat> but the important thing here is that <clears throat> I can treat this as a much simpler problem. Because x2 minus x3 is just this right here. It's how far it was stretched from equilibrium. <clears throat> so 
So I can ignore the weight completely as long as I treat the problem that's starting from here. This is equilibrium and I stretch it down so far. Or I can bring weight into it and then I treat it from here. But this means, let's, do, let's work out the problem. Let's actually figure out what the, uh, let's figure out the initial acceleration and then I'm gonna change the problem slightly to get the exact same answer. So from this, I have K is 14.7. Uh, 14.7 times how far it stretched from equilibrium, which is five meters. And that's equal to three times A. So that's the acceleration at that point. It is positive. Uh, if we put a vector symbol in there, we're still good on that. It is positive because it's going to accelerate upwards. Now I'm going to take the exact same problem. I took a spring, I hung it down, the, the spring right here, put a three kilogram mass on it, and it hangs down an additional two meters. Then I take that spring and I put it on a horizontal surface and I attach one end, fix one end. It has some length, don't know what it is, but this kind of hangs naturally here. Uh, presumably, it actually would hang four meters because an ideal spring is massless. I attach a three kilogram mass to it and I pull it back five meters and I let go. What is the acceler initial acceleration? Well, the magnitude of the initial acceleration. Don't we just say it? Zero. Ooh, no, wrong one. I pull it out here and I let go. It's gonna be the same as the rate one. Yeah, point four four point five. Four four point five. That one. Yeah, you know when I just uh, either zero or one or something that's on the board. So I pull it out this far. I let go. The thing starts oscillating. It's the same problem. So if I ask how fast is it going at the equilibrium point, well, it's the 